damn late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. Well, we ain't killing their army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like, say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing the great Patrick Coburn. He really is the most important Western reporter in the Middle East, covering all the wars for us. And, of course, uh, writes for the Independent, independent independent.co.uk. He wrote Age of Jihad and Chaos and Caliphate and Muqtada, the book on Muqtada al-Sadr. And, uh, of course, uh, again, independent.co.uk. And the most recent here is the Saudi Arabia drone attacks have changed global warfare on the line from Baghdad, Iraq today. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Uh, very happy to have you back on the show here. So um, I get well, I'm not sure I want to talk about Iraq so bad, but or ask you about Iraq so bad. I mean, but uh, let's start with this article about Saudi Arabia and uh, the Houthis and the drone and missile attack on the uh, Saudi oil facilities there last week. What do you think? Well, this is a big change in the Middle East. Uh, Previously, the assumption was that uh, the U.S., Saudi Arabia could use their air power on uh, uh, other countries, on uh, uh, movements, and uh, there was no real comeback from the other side. But uh, with the uh, drone attacks on these uh, two uh, Saudi oil facilities, Abqaiq and uh, uh, Karais, the uh, suddenly that's all changed. That uh, guys who have some uh, uh, drones that probably you know maybe cost you a couple of hundred thousand dollars can suddenly cut the world's oil supply from Saudi Arabia uh, by half. Uh, they weren't able to defend these places, so suddenly it's a much more equal playing field in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, well, now, so there's a reporter that I talk to pretty regularly out of Yemen named Nasser Arabi, and he was saying that the Houthis, not only have they taken credit, but they specified that they had help from Saudi Shia, who launched the attack from their territories, how they were able to uh, launch that successful attack there. What do you think of that? Yeah, well, that's very interesting. I mean, I had sort of speculated a bit about that at the time. The About 15% of the population of Saudi Arabia is uh, Shia, a lot of them in this area called Eastern Province, where the oil facilities are. Uh, and they've always been discriminated against. But under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, this has got a lot worse. Uh, earlier in the year, there was mass execution of uh, Shia protesters, uh, guys who have been protesting in the street, a lot of whom were sort of you know, teenagers when they were protested. They were put in jail, they were tortured, and then earlier this year, they were, uh, they were executed. So there'll be a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger there. So I think if the Houthis, the, there'll be a lot of anger and a lot of hatred there. Mm-hmm. And now I guess you're talking about in your article here too that whether Iran was directly involved or not, really, even if it was just the Houthis and their local uh, Saudi Shia friends that did this attack, that still drives home a very important lesson for a potential war with Iran that asymmetric warfare can be extremely powerful when you have the home field advantage there like that. Yeah, I mean, previously the U.S. and Saudi Arabia might have calculated, you know, that they could go in, they could uh, blow up the Iranian uh, oil refineries and uh, uh, oil industry, and there was no real comeback from Iran. But uh, what we saw with this attack was that the Iranians are saying, you know, you do it to us, we'll do it to you. You've stopped us exporting oil through uh, U.S. sanctions. 
well, we'll make it uh, pretty difficult for you to export oil as well. So uh, they have a common why there'd be no U.S. or Saudi retaliation for these uh, attacks, although they're blaming the Iranians, uh, which seems a bit dubious, but they are blaming Iran, but also saying we're not going to do anything about it, which is pretty amazing given the amount of money that these two countries spend on, on arms. You know, the U.S. defense budget, I think, is around $750 billion a year. The Saudis spent uh, around $68 billion uh, dollars uh, in the last year buying uh, buying weapons, but they can't do anything because uh, they can't really face that retaliation. No, not just against oil industry, but you know, there's, there are things like desalination plants, which Saudi Arabia is very dependent on for uh, fresh water, that uh, are very uh, vulnerable to a, a drone or an attack by a small missile. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very compact mm-hmm. and you could uh, damage or destroy them pretty easily. Well, thank goodness that they accept the reality of that. And there have been times where we've been really worried that the American government was just in denial about the vulnerability of especially American forces in Kuwait, in Iraq, where they're embedded with the Shiites. We're about to talk about that some more in a minute, where we got Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan and, of course, in Qatar and Bahrain, these huge bases, all vulnerable to Iranian retaliation. So... Seeing the Americans, as you said, announcing that they're not going to do anything about it is a real relief that they know they really can't. Thank God they really know that. Well, I think that's kind of the lesson that the Iranians are trying to drive home, not just with the attack on uh, these two oil facilities on the one of the 14th of September. Uh, but earlier, you'll recall, they... Uh, they shot down a U.S. Uh, very high-flying, highly technical drone, which apparently uh, uh, the U.S. Air Force thought the Iranians uh, couldn't hit with a missile, didn't have a mi- missile capable of hitting. So they learned different. And then there was this rather sort of peculiar attack on um, some uh, Japanese tankers, with, uh, which it kind of looks as though there was a sort of limpid mines were placed on them but not enough to sink them, just to blow us a hole above the waterline uh, to say, look, this is what if we, we could take these things if uh, we wanted to by just putting a bigger mine here, but uh, we're just showing you what we're up to, what we're capable of. So I think that these are all messages being sent, saying, uh, do it to us, we'll do it to you, and we've got to come back if you, if you attack us. Hang on just one second. Hey, guys, did I ever tell you about LibertyStickers.com? It's just nothing but anti-government propaganda for the back of your truck. I invented most of them, the good ones anyway. Anti-war stuff, anti-cops, making fun of all the candidates in the upcoming election. LibertyStickers.com. Hey, guys, check out the great lineup of podcasts we've got going on over at the Libertarian Institute. There's me, Foreign Policy and Focus with Kyle Anzalone, Free Man Beyond the Wall with Pete Quinones, a.k.a. Mance Raider, the Liberty Weekly Podcast with Patrick McFarlane and Keith Knight, and our newest edition, Jen the Libertarian, with Jen Monroe. Check them all out at libertarianinstitute.org. Hey guys, don't you think it'd be cool if you could go to college, but Tom Woods was the dean of the thing? Yeah, well, something like that. Check out libertyclassroom.com, where Tom Woods went and had his pick of all the best professors to teach their courses in uh, the real history and economics that you didn't learn when you went to college the first time around, or maybe you didn't learn because you skipped your higher education altogether. But uh, here's some real American history and some real economics, the kind of stuff that you've been missing. It's all at libertyclassroom.com, and make sure to click through the link in the right-hand margin of my website, scotthorton.org. Okay, now, so you talked about how you're in Baghdad, Iraq today. What story are you covering there now? Well, it relates to the story we've just been talking about, which is, what worries Iraqis when I talk to them in Baghdad is, you know, is Iraq going to be the battlefield between the U.S. and Iran? Uh, if there's a confrontation, that confrontation turns into crisis or maybe a war. But you see quite a lot of that already here. Baghdad's an awful lot better than it was the last two years since the, uh, the capture of uh, Mosul, the ISIS, uh, Daesh capital, uh, in 2017. Uh, and things are a lot better in Baghdad. You know, you see, they don't have all these uh, horrible cement walls they used to have everywhere, which are anti-blast walls, which made you feel as if you were in prison the whole time. And they, they've opened up the green zone, so uh, 
there's more roads and bridges, so you're not stuck in a traffic jam the whole time. Uh, you know, you can see lights, a lot of people around late at night. You didn't see that previously. So a lot of people, things have got better the last two years, but now they're all sort of, people are telling me, you know, they're worried that uh, the future's, you know, as they would say, going to be darker because uh, there's the prospect of yet another war here. Don't know if it will happen, but, um, you know, it's just on the horizon uh, between the US and Iran. You know, probably they, 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 that's right because... You know, if there's another occasion in which something happens that is blamed on the Iranians and Trump sort of blames everything on the Iranians that happens uh, in the Middle East, then, you know, it may be that the next time around it'll be too humiliating not to uh, retaliate against Iran to do something. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the risk is growing that that will happen. Uh, as I said, it was pretty extraordinary, despite these incredible sums spent on weapons, that they uh, were completely caught by surprise by this uh, this attack on uh, uh, this enormous oil facility upcake in in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Now, so here's the thing about it. I mean, American forces still stationed in Iraq, number in at least the low thousands, I guess, uh, maybe you know better, uh, special operations forces and spies, and they're still embedded with the Iraqi army fighting, I guess, Iraq War three and a half in Western Iraq against what's left of ISIS or Al-Qaeda in Iraq, right? Yeah, there isn't much of it left, you know, but what, uh, what there's another war sort of beginning here and uh, what sort of energizes it here in the middle. Uh, uh, Israel has uh, been la launching some uh, drone attacks here, one of them in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. uh, the ostensible reason for this is that they say they're hitting uh, Iranian-supplied missiles, supplied what's, uh, to uh, what's called the Hash al-Shabi, uh, which is a... Uh, uh, a sort of coalition of paramilitary, Shia paramilitary groups. Uh, they're also important in parliament, uh, but there are about 130, 150,000 of them. Uh, the US sees them as being sort of pro Iranian, sometimes says there's Iranian proxies and uh, so forth. But the fact the Israelis have got involved has sort of uh, raise the political temperature here and in parliament there's a bill going through demanding that uh, u.s troops leave and uh, so forth so uh, there's a more edgy atmosphere here than there was uh, a few months ago mm -hmm. and now um mm -hmm. these as the media calls them iran backed shiite militias are they mostly still just referring to the Badr brigade under its different names I say, uh, well, there are there are little, there are about thirty or thirty of them. There's, but the Badr is brigade is one of the biggest ones. There's one called the Saib al Haq, mm -hmm. but all from the Sadrist. Uh, I saw the leader of one called uh, the Kataib uh, Said uh, Al Shahada this, this morning. Uh, he was saying quite interesting. Uh, a guy called Abu Ala. Uh, he was uh, saying that they were uh, working away making drones and. They uh, they had a camp outside Baghdad, which on the uh, 12th of August was attacked by uh, Israeli drones. And Israel has claimed this, so there isn't any question about that that's what happened. Uh, he says that uh, these drones were launched from a... Well, there was a, a, an Iraqi government report commissioned into what had happened that found on looking at the radar that... Uh, these drones had come from a U.S. base in northeast Syria. So, uh, you know, it's all kind of weird, but, uh, you know, you can uh, you can feel that uh, uh, the temperature is going up here. Mm -hmm. Well, the constant theme of all of this stuff, of course, is the regime change of 2003, not just against Saddam Hussein, but in favor of those Shiite groups that have taken power and have taken the capital city. And then the reaction to that and the attempted cleanup or attempt to limit Iranian power and influence after doing so much to increase it. And yet all of that seems to backfire when you're talking about, say, for example, 
the regime change against Iran's friend Assad in Syria, which ended up creating the Islamic State and required us aligning with the Shia in Iraq again, uh, for example, or giving Iran credit for everything the Houthis do in uh, this losing war in Yemen, so that now essentially the narrative is has so much truth to it that Iranian power and influence has expanded in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. And so now they must be confronted. The Americans are more desperate than ever to want to try to do something about the consequences of all that they have wrought. No, that's, uh, that, I mean, that's uh, really true. It's, I mean, you know, it's the, uh, by sort of, you know, in 2003, the Iranians had the Taliban who they, uh, uh, hated on one side of them in Afghanistan, and Saddam Hussein, and they hated on the other side. Uh, in 2001, I should have said. Uh, on the other side, uh, both have gone, thanks to the US. So Iranian influence expanded. Um, then, you know, within sort of Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Iran has sort of relations with local militias which uh, the U.S. sort of announced as proxies like uh, the Houthis and Hezbollah, but actually they're not really proxies that come from indigenous Shia communities. That's what sort of holds them together. They're sort of, they get uh, support from uh, Iran, all from going back decades. So they're close to the Iranians, but Iranians don't really have command and control of these outfits. Uh, they're pretty autonomous. Um, and... In Iraq, it's a little difficult. It, it depends which organization I'm talking about. Some seem to be very close to Iran, others uh, further distance from Iran. But if they come under pressure from the U.S., then they're, they're, that, that will become self-fulfilling. They'll sort of rely on the Iranians to back them up. Right. Well, the Americans, I guess, ever since Sistani called for one man, one vote in 2004, the Americans kind of made peace with the idea that, well, I guess it's going to be scary in Dawa, but we got to compete with Iran for influence with them. And so even though they really lost that fight back in 2008, they're still fighting it. They're still hoping that American money and weaponry can outweigh the Baghdad government's previous and obviously pretty permanent relationship with Iran. Yeah, I think that there is... Uh... You know, that's the same mistake that they still made again and again. You know, there's a very simple thing about Iraq and Iran. You know, the, Iran is uh, run by, you know, a Shia a Muslim uh, government, and um, so is uh, Baghdad. You know, it's a majority Shia country here. So a guy was uh, saying to me uh, last night, who was uh, a leader of one of the Shia parties, he said, you know, in, in religious terms, you know, our relationship with Iran gives us strategic depth. You know, we need another big Shia country. This is a guy who actually doesn't like the Iranians very much. But the, but the fact that they both belong to this religion means that at the end of the day, they're always going to sort of go for the, uh, the Iranian side. And the fact that Iran is, you know, down the road from here with this enormous common border. Now, let me ask you this. When you talk about how Baghdad itself, the capital city there, is doing so much better now, have many Sunnis been allowed to come back, or is it still a 85 90% Shiite city now? I don't know what the percentages are. Uh, I guess some have come back. It's, very, it's kind of difficult to know that unless you sort of wander around and talk to estate agents, which I sometimes do. Uh, the, uh, but the, you know, the Sunni have kind of lost out here. You know, from you know, to, up to under Saddam... And also under the British rule and under the Ottomans, uh, the Saudi Arabs were the dominant uh, community here. They're about sort of twenty percent of the population, and then you know, the Kurds are about seventeen percent, and the rest are Shia. And since two thousand and three, this the Shia have been sort of running things uh, here. So the Sunni, particularly, you know, during the uh, the ISIS period. Uh, you know, ISIS took Fallujah to the Sunni town down the road, to, uh, the road to Jordan here. You know, it was recaptured, Ramadi. A lot of these cities were, you know, hammered with artillery and uh, fire and um, bombardment from the air. Uh, Mosul very badly damaged, particularly the old city, an awful lot of people killed. So that community has been really sort of battered. So uh, 
they sort of aren't going anywhere. They don't have an effective political leadership. Uh, you know, some people would say it was to a degree their fault that they they, uh, they opted for Al Qaeda and ISIS as their sort of vehicle for opposing the Baghdad government. But they did, you know. So they've they've been they've been truly hammered here. The Kurds also had the bad idea of having a referendum uh, a couple of years ago, looking for independence, and uh, it was never going to happen. And the the Iraqi army retook Kirkuk. So. This is very much a sort of Shia state at the moment. But it's still, as I said, it's a lot better than it was. But, you know, but the bar is fairly low. This place has been you know, the victim of sort of war and civil war and sanctions and more war for 40 years. So it'll take a long time to recover. So in the early part of this decade, you and I had talked about how the Sunnis had been essentially cut loose. They weren't really being dominated by the Iraqi Shiite government as much as just sort of uh, spun out into a stateless sort of situation out there. And that I remember, of course, in the spring of 2013, you talked about how the Iraqi army was actually AWOL from Mosul and that all of Western Iraq was really ripe for the taking by the, at that time, the want to be Islamic state, which then came to do exactly that. But so... That seems to be like the the question for now, right, is whether the Shiite government is doing anything to reintegrate the populations of Western Iraq into their system at all, or whether they're just as alienated out there, you know? Well, I think there is a lot of alienation out there, but they're also, you know, kind of defeated. I mean, uh, the last few years of under ISIS, living under ISIS rule was pretty bad for them. The, uh, so... Uh, you know, so they're still sort of rebuilding more damage, you know, uh, there's still a lot of, sort of bitterness and hatred, but as a result of ISIS, who cooperated with ISIS, who killed who, and so forth. I was talking to one tribe uh, up the, uh, further up the Euphrates, who uh, ISIS massacred, they lost about 1,200 people, you know, so when you have sort of uh, bloodletting like that, it takes a long time for people to forget. Uh, and so I think that the, the Sunni are pretty and uh, pretty crushed at the moment. Yeah. Well, um, I, you know, it seems like that just means we're setting the stage right now for the next war, right? Because they can't just be completely, um, you know, abandoned out there with no revenue and no protection, no law and order, and no anything at all. Which is, it sounds like the situation they're in. Yeah, it's not good from that point of view, but I'm not sure there's going to be a reason. There'll be a reaction down the road, but not quite yet, you know. Uh, it's uh, not a lot of them in sort of refugee camps. Uh, you know, pushed out of cities, they can't go home. Uh, they lost their land, they lost their property, you know. If you're a refugee and you, you know, you're pushed out of some town, you don't come back for five years. When you do, you're very likely to find somebody who's taken over your house and there's no plans to give it up again, you know. So it's... Uh, things begin to gel it's very still to put things back like the way they were right yeah i've read a few reports of the iraqi military forces taking severe retribution against people who are accused of working with isis i mean not just in the the courts where people are given the death penalty routinely all day long but also in the refugee camps and people just being tortured straight eye for an eye no no attempt at reconciliation more like yeah we're gonna humiliate you all over again for what you've done, kind of a attitude. Yeah, I mean, you you find that. I mean, ISIS sort of, you know, conducted these sort of massacres of Shia and Yazidis and uh, and others. You know, he put them online in order to terrify people. You know, so there's, uh, uh, you know, that lives with people, and they, people will still be looking for vengeance. You find you find some places like. Uh, I was just down in uh, a Shia a shrine city of uh, Karbala. There was actually a bomb attack there uh, last weekend. Twelve people were killed. A guy got on a bus um, and uh, left a uh, parcel under a seat. He got off it, uh, and uh, the bomb blew up, killed twelve people. Now he came from a town uh, which used to be Sunni, uh, was an ISIS and Al Qaeda sort of stronghold in 2014. Uh, the Shia militias moved in, defeated uh, ISIS, and then drove the, the civilian population out. 
uh, you know, maybe 50,000 people lost their homes. And they, you know, they demand them back, but, but they, they haven't got them back. They're not likely to get them back. Uh, that, that's a pretty severe, extreme example, but you find that all over the place. Yeah. Well, that's what the future is going to look like from now on, essentially, right, is the Sunni kings of Arabia, they can't take back Baghdad for the Sunnis, but they can fling suicide bombers at it from now on. And so why would they stop, right? Well, there's that. You know, you also got to get young guys, I or three guys in a nice cell, apparently. You have to be a bit careful with anything, but, you know, you said the government says they've arrested people, uh, you know, you want us to be a bit careful of have they really done it or have they just tortured guys and they're making confession and so forth. Right. Uh, pretty well everybody gets tortured here and gets uh, accused of that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, what interested me was that these three guys came from this town, a place called Jarf al uh, which uh, from which the Saudi had all been driven out uh, and not allowed back. So on the one hand, you could say, you know, that's a big pool of recruits for uh, for, our, for Daesh. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's not a sort of living local community that can give them the support. It's the refugees living in shacks or in, you know, one room, one room apartments with whole families crammed into them. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming back on the show, Patrick. It's great to talk to no, you again. Appreciate really appreciate it. All the best. Okay, guys, that is the great Patrick Coburn. He's at the independent, independent.co.uk. And of course, uh, the Age of Jihad and Chaos and Caliphate and Muqtad al sadr and a great many books. Uh, he's the author of those, too. All right, y'all, thanks. Find me at libertarianinstitute.org, at scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, and reddit.com slash Show. Oh, yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan, at foolserand.us.